Oh, no. No, you got one. No, I got one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, tomorrow is exclusively for ladies. Okay, so welcome to our Shia. If you remember the last few weeks, we've been starting with the chauffeur. For those who have not heard the chauffeur, and uh, those online who have not heard the chauffeur, and if you have heard it, you can hear it again. <laughs> So, just mark your card for next week. We will be talking about, we thought long and hard about what topics to talk about. And we had a lot of discussions with people what they wanted to hear and people came up with all sorts of topics. But I decided to ignore all that advice because I felt that to me, the most important thing that people might get out of it, they might not get out of it, is to go through the machsa. And go through, we said we we're going to do an extra share, we remember, but people didn't like the idea of coming out to hear me twice in a week. Except you maybe will come to hear me tomorrow, I don't know, but the rest of the women maybe not. So the idea of coming to hear me twice in a week didn't seem to go down so well. Um, so, and then added on to the sermons on Rosh Hashanah and everything else. So people felt as having one share, and I wanted to do the maths, I think it's very important. I uh, mentioned it in my article this week that I wrote for the newsletter. There is a wonderful website, and I wrote the address in it. If you look at it online, depending on how it's transmitted, you might be able to click on it because I put it as a hyperlink. So hopefully you can click on it. It's called Beure Hatafila dot something or other. It's either dot com or dot org. I put it in the newsletter. It's a wonderful website. Goes through every aspect of davening, so I learned a lot from it. And as I said, I think it's laziness on behalf of people coming to shul and expecting one of these explained services and expecting everyone to hand them everything on a uh, silver platter. But it's instead one should put in the effort oneself I encourage you to buy your own maxodium. You can make your own notes. Uh, but if not, perhaps we can use the maxodium of the shul to go through some of the, touch on some of the basics, uh, ideas of some of the extra tefillos that we're going to say. So that we're going to do next week. I can't guarantee we'll finish at 8.15. But uh, if uh, people want to leave at 8.15 next week, they're welcome to do so. But I hope people will at least get a little bit from it. So when it comes to Rosh Hashanah davening, they can have a little bit more, first of all, understanding and second of all, maybe some kavana as to what is going on. But tonight we're going to speak about Rosh Hashanah in general. So, as you know, I like to start off my shiurim talking about topics by challenging the status quo. Everybody knows Rosh Hashanah is a day that we're judged and all that stuff. So where does it come from? What is it all about? So, if you look in the Torah, we know quite clearly the first day of the seventh Hebrew month is a Yom Tov. It says very clearly. You can't do any work. So it's clear, first day Rosh Hashanah is a Yom Tov. It's got a din of Yom Tov, like Pesach, like Sukkot. You cannot do any work except for that you need for food preparation, so you can light fires and that sort of stuff. So that's clearly written, mentions that a couple of times. That's clear. Then it goes on to add a couple of extra words Zichron twice. Once it says Yom Zichron Teruah, remembrance. Oh, what's this remembrance all about? And then another time it says Yom Teruah Yelochem. A day of truas it should be for you. Interestingly enough, never mentions the word Shofar in connection to Rosh Hashanah. Where is Shofar mentioned in the Torah? Shofar is mentioned by Yovel. When it's the Jubilee year, all the slaves, when do they go free? When they hear the shofar. It says, You blow the shofar to Ruah. So we know that on the Jubilee year, which we don't have anymore, see the shield we gave on Pasha's Bahar, available on YouTube, as to why we don't have it and what that's all about. So that's where it mentions shofar. So the Gemara puts the two and two together, that when it talks about Vavata Shofa Turua, just like we have the Shofa Turua by Yovel, when it mentions Trua by Rosh Hashanah, it refers to a Shofa as opposed to, I don't know, trumpets or uh, any other instrument. So that's what we learn now. We have to hear the Shofa and we have to do various notes. We're not going to go into that now. But we have this word Zichron, a remembrance. They strange. We don't find Zichron all of a sudden. We have Zechel Etzias Mitzrayim. We have various Pesach, even Sukkot, is to remember the Anane HaKovod. It says quite clearly to remember the Anane HaKovod, to remember Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. So we know a lot of mitzvot 
are dependent on Zeche Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, but this one is just a young Zichro, a day of remembrance. So what on earth is this remembering? What are we supposed to be remembering? And who are we supposed to be remembering? So, the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah goes into the fact that there's a debate as to when the world was created. Although, as we discussed, it is not when the world was created, as to what was day one. Because obviously there was no months and time before the world was created. So therefore, it doesn't mean the world was already existing. And Hashem said, ah, this is the correct date. Let's plunk the world today. But once he created it, says the Gemara, what did the world look like? Did it look like Nissan time? where uh, everything is in, uh, sprouted already and beautiful? Or was it Tishri time, where the nights are getting longer, and therefore things are a bit more dark, and it's a time of planting, and therefore it's not ready? So that's the Machloikas, and we say that the first of Tishri was the birthday of man. As we say on Rosh Hashanah, Hayoim Haras Olam. It doesn't mean the day Hashem harasses the world. You might think he does because he puts you through all the ringer with all this davening and all this craziness. But it actually means the birthday of the world. Hayom Haras Olam. Even though the world was created a few days earlier. Because if first of Tishrei is the anniversary of the birth of man, that was the sixth day of creation. So the world was created on the 25th of Elul, if my math serves me correctly. 25, 26, 27, 28... 29, 1. Yes. So the 25th of Elul was the anniversary of light and darkness, and the 6th day is the anniversary of man. Now, many of you here have been in industries, and you've been in business, and there is a common theme that you have what you call a audit, regular audits of how you are doing. You have each employee sits down, and they go through, uh, it's got a name which just escapes me at the moment. You have to uh, sit down and you do your, go through how your last year went, set up your goals. A review, thank you. Yes, you have your yearly review, thank you, yes. You have your yearly review in business and see how you did the last year and whether you're entitled perhaps to a pay rise or not. And therefore, that's a regular thing that uh, people can appreciate, people can understand, goes on the whole time in business and in the world. School as well. At the end of the year, they evaluate the teachers. How did our school year do? How did the kids do? Should we put them up to the next year? Should we make them repeat it? Should we sling them out? Should we send them for counselling? We make an audit. We make a review. And that is basically exactly what our Kodesh Baruch Hu is doing on Rosh Hashanah. It's a review. It's an audit. It's been a year. It's time now to see how we are doing. He's left us alone, so to speak, for a year. He's left us to our own devices to gobble up all the wonderful things we were prescribed in the previous Rosh Hashanah. And Hashem says, right, no, let's see. How did you do? What did you achieve? What did you accomplish? What are your good points, your strong points? Are you entitled to a pay rise? Am I going to sling you out of the world? Am I going to send you for some sort of counseling? That is basically in a uh, gist what is going on here to Rosh Hashanah. Now, I wrote some uh, papers uh, which we uh, circulated last year and will circulate again about Rosh Hashanah. If you look in the Ila, at the very end of the Ila, we say the special prayers instead of the long al which we've said eight times already by then, we're getting fed up of sins already, it's getting late, our minds are uh, focusing on other things perhaps, but we say the special at our you separated man, and uh, we, we say the special, uh, special uh, salicha, the special forgiveness. And in it, we say, Hashem gave Hashem This is the end, and now the beginning of our salicha and our kapara. So that we should stop our evil doing. We should stop our wrong doing. So what is the idea behind all this? What it's trying to say is, you see, if there was no Rosh Hashanah, you would just go on and on and on and on and on. There would be no end. You would just come to the end of your life. You'd be like, well, let's look at your whole life. You see, whoops, you've got a whole big block of uh, sins and a whole great, great collection of uh, good things. But you take it as a whole. But if you split it up into years, and you frighten the life out of you quite literally once a year, so you're like, ah, 
I better stop. We're going to talk about how that works in a minute. Or a few. And you realize, ah, I better change my ways. I better mend my ways. So you stop what you do. You get slicha. And we wipe out entirely the evil things of the previous year. <sighs> then we can go back to sinning again. And then the next, that's, <laughs> that's not a uh, permission, but anyway. And it comes to the next year. Again, we get frightened out of our lives. And we repent. And everything's gone. <sighs> back to where we were before. You get the idea. It comes to the end of your life. And Baruch Hashem, everything's small. Because we split up everything into years, and each year was accounted for on its own, so we don't get this big block of problems right at the end, which is what nobody wants. So the man nechdal mi oishek yodenu. So that Hashem gave us this wonderful day. The chinuch goes through and develops this theme, and he goes on to say as follows: Shehoya mechaste hakeil aburov. This is a great kindness from Hashem for His creations. To do this audit and to do this review. So that you won't get too much virus, you won't build up too much problems, and you'll be able to slowly but surely, oh, it's not too much, we'll get rid of it, yes, we'll do you kapora, you've only got the magic. So you break it up into small amounts and to see what you're doing. And he goes on to say, it's interesting, we talk about the Sifri Chaim and the Sifri Mavis, the books of life and the books of death. We talk about these books. The Gemara talks about the books. You know, he's sitting there and he's sealed. So it says the Chinuch, there are actually no books. There are no books. There is no vault. There is no library of heaven where all the books of every year are stored. There is no hard drive. There is no memory stick uh, where you can look back in the records and see. He says this idea of all these books is for us to understand it on our own level. We talk about the face of Hashem, the hand of Hashem. Hashem has no hands, Hashem has no face. But we talk about Dibro Torah Koloshan B'nai Adam. The Torah talks in ways that we as humans can understand. So it talks about Yad Hashem and the face of Hashem and all this sort of stuff. So it says the Chinuch, the same as with the books. Because we understand that Hashem is deciding whether we're living or dying or this or that, we think of it in terms of books. We're inscribed, we're written. But actually, which is... Uh, interesting way of thinking. Hashem does it all in his mind, whatever. You know, he's got it all uh, worked out. You can keep the cheshman, don't worry. He's not going to forget about you. So therefore, there are no books. Where was it? But it's there to, uh, to scare you. So that's this zikaron, this remembrance. What we are being remembered is twofold. One is Hashem is remembering us. Yom zikaron, Hashem is remembering us. Ah, yes. Let's see what you are. It's a zikron that Hashem is remembering us. Looking what we are doing, remembering what we have done. And that's why when we say zikronos in the extra pasukim of Musaf, what do we talk about? We talk about Hashem remembering stuff, right? Hashem remembered Noyach. Hashem remembered Avram. Hashem, and when we talk about the beginning bracha, which frightens the life out of everybody, talks about Hashem remembers everything you've done. There is nothing hidden. What you've forgotten about, Hashem clearly remembers. So the zikaron is Hashem is remembering us. On the flip side is we're supposed to remember him at least once a year. You know, we're supposed to remember HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But perhaps we'll come back to that soon. But, um... So where did it say here about the books? I wanted to read that out. Um, oh, so it says here in the Torah that that's only a marshal. It's only an example. Al derech marshal be'inyan hashagosay baruch hu alehem shkedei she kanso advarim be'ozne hashoyim. That's in order that you will understand it. You'll get frightened, but there are no real books, right? There's no real books. Of, of life and death, it's just you're getting decided. I thought that's interesting that uh, these books are a figment of our imagination. But uh, anyway, so I always thought of a muscle. You know, it's very strange people say, look, we've already spoken about in shul over the last couple of weeks about changing things at the time of Rosh Hashanah. Do things differently, do things in a better way. We quoted from the Ramah who says, those who eat non passy soil bread throughout the whole year, which is okay in, in most cases without going into that now but Rosh Hashanah week from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur they should be stringent only have Pass Yisrael <laughs> and Kedorim Ke'elu it says and things like this you're supposed to take on that's what he said we wanted the Davim Mincha before Shkia Marif after Shkia which Baruch Hashem this part of the world this time of the year 
it's not even going to cost us anything but a few minutes, so we're not like we're coming later or doing anything extra. Baruch Hashem, it fell directly into our lap. We do things a little bit differently. We come to shul a bit earlier than we usually do. We take, hopefully, we take a little bit of more inspiration. We take a little bit more learning. We do things differently. We take on new things. We... So the question is, is that Kodesh Baruch Hu dumb? I mean, you know, what are we trying to do? Pull the wool over his eyes here? You know, first of all, he doesn't even remember last year. You know, last year you were all good, yes. You took on all these things. You did shuva. Oh, it was great. But then straight after Yom Kippur, straight after Sukkot, whatever it was, you're right back to where you were. So what happened? Yeah, the next year, oh, yeah, that's great. I said, okay, well. After three or four years, I mean, you know, he's getting an old routine already. I mean, how can he keep pulling the wool over his eyes? Shem knows everything that goes on. And he sees everything. He knows. He hears. He listens. So how, how, how does it even work? What is this, this game of charades? You have that here? Charades? Charades? Yeah, charades. Right? Oh, there's a charade over here. You know, this game. Cat and mouse. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll pretend. Yes. Oh, yeah. You might be able to pull the wool over your boss's eyes in a review. You know, you come up with some good work and he thinks you're amazing. But how come we can do this to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? So I want to give a marshal, a parable. You know I like to give personal stories because people don't take note of stories of hundreds of years. Oh, that was different times, you know. Things have changed now, you know. We're more inclusive, you know, it's different. And stories about Rabbi, ah, oh, they're Rabbi, you know, stories about me. Everybody knows me. They know my faults, you know. Not afraid of telling me them. So, you know, it's, it's something, you can, <laughs> something you can relate to. So I like to give personal stories and personal uh, personal parables. So a good few years ago it was now and uh, I was working for the Manchester based inn in the slaughterhouse. It was just before Rosh Hashanah. I remember we shechted, I didn't shecht, I was, uh, I won't make you all screamish about what I was doing but anyway, uh, we did uh, 1600 chickens and we did 800 hens. Uh, No, the big things, what are they? Uh, Turkeys, yes. 800 turkeys, right. Uh, And we did some hens too. Because uh, people make soup out of hens, apparently, in England. It's very, you know, they don't make it out of chicken soup. It's actually hen soup. But uh, I try to get hens here, but it's very hot. Anyway, about uh, coming back to the story. So all of a sudden, you know, the line was going quite slowly. Everyone was talking, I mean, quite quickly. Everyone was laughing and joking, having a jolly good time. I was right at the end of the line. And it was a jolly boy's outing, right? Bit of blood and guts and gore. But besides for that, everyone was having a great time. Laughing, joking, joking. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, the line started getting slow. And I noticed because the things were coming to me much slower. I was like, oh, time to breathe for a change, right? And then I noticed it went very quiet, very quiet. And I could hear the noise of the fans going. I thought, oh, what's going on here? I'm talking, everyone's on their best behavior. Everyone's looking good. And I looked to my left, and there's this fellow, all looking posh, and all in his clothes, in his boots, and his hat, perfectly clean, of course. And he is busy messing about doing stuff. And I looked at him, and, and the woman next to me, Miss, was he was the inspector. He was the inspector. Walked out, you know, he did his thing for 10, 15 minutes. He walked out, ah, oh, the hullabaloo started again. The line started racing round. I was rushed off my feet. I thought, hey, vey, uh, couldn't he stay a little bit longer? I was enjoying the uh, easier workload. And things carried on rushing around. I felt like thinking maybe you should quickly pop his head back in just to see <laughs> half an hour later or an hour later. But I thought, of, oh, this is what is happening in Rosh Hashanah. This inspector, these inspectors, they're not stupid. They know that when they're not there, things are not quite going the way they should be going, you know? Same with me as, you know, working as a, uh, a rabbinical coordinate. You go in and you tell them, show me what you're doing. Oh, you know, they tell you out a piece of lettuce. Everyone's going to wash it perfectly because you're standing over them, you know? And uh, when they hear you coming and they see you coming, some people have the mirrors, you see, so they can't be caught, you know, so they have a similar, so you see, they're coming. And I know that because I used to have it when I was in Mashkir, so I can know when, uh, when the rabbi was coming to check on me, you know, you have a little thing, so you see when you hear him coming, you see, you know, and uh, whatever. So, you know, when you see him coming, ah, oh, then we'll, we'll do well. As soon as he's gone, back to where it is. But, notwithstanding the inspector knows all of this stuff, notwithstanding all of that, he bases his reports, and he bases his ratings, and he bases whatever it is that he is there to do on the few minutes that he sees, right? Those are the few minutes he sees. He knows, well, you know, if I came back a little bit later, I might find all sorts of things that might end up on Channel 10, on Dirty, whatever it's called, on that show where they criticize all the restaurants, uh, huh? Dirty Dining, you know. If I come back later, I could find plenty of things on Channel 10. 
plenty of material, but I'm only judging on the time that I'm there. I thought to myself, we talk about here, the chatzte akel. I think that is HaKadosh Baruch Hu's kindness. He knows what is going on the rest of the year. He knows. He's not stupid. He can see it. It's there. I'm watching you. Hello. He can see it. He knows. But through his great kindness, he decides that he's going to base his report. He's going to base his annual review. He's going to base his audit only on what he sees when he comes. We know this is a time is known as Melech Masode, the king is in the field, the Koshpoch is close. Dirushu Hashem be Himotso, seek out Hashem where he may be found, which is the month of Elul, and Ila Dodi Vododi Li. I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me. The first letters of each of those words are Elul. So when is Hashem our beloved? When is our friend in Elul? It's a time of great closeness to the Koshpoch, Tishri as well, even more so. And Koshpoch actually comes, Yom Kippur, Koshpoch. Actually comes lematum yud fachim as the expression goes lower than ten cubits, which is supposed to be some kabbalistic thing that Hashem never normally descends to the ground, but on your kippah he comes right to the ground. Whatever that means, I've no idea. But Hashem is right here, and He decides I am going to give you a kindness. Yes, I know exactly what goes on, but I am only going to judge you. I am only going to rate you. I am only going to score you based on what I see. When I am there. And that, as I'm sure you would appreciate, is a great chesed, as we said, mechaste hakel. This is one of the great kindnesses of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he chooses to do things this way. Because he could do it differently, and then we're rather stuck. But he chose to do it this way. And that's why it's not a game of charades, it's not a charades, it's not a pulling the wool over his eyes. He knows exactly what's going on. But he chooses, out of his great kindness, to only judge us in this period. That's why it's important we do tshuva. It's important that we take on upon ourselves to behave better, not just between man and Hashem, but Hashem wants to see that we're getting on with everybody else. He's coming down to see, and he's like, ooh, are you getting on with everybody? Is everybody b'shalem? Is everybody enjoying themselves together? If not, ah, whoops, then we have a problem. We'll talk about that uh, uh, soon. But I wanted to say, we talked about how frightening this could be, right? And this is a scary time, and how tshuva is, 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 is sad, you know, you're recalling all the things you've done. So I wanted to read out some. So this is the Mate Ephraim. The Mate Ephraim, if you like, is the guide for the halachos on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's a sefer specifically written just for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The Mishnah Barura quotes it extensively. And this is known as the, uh, this is the halacha that we follow for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. That's the accepted, certainly Ashkenazi uh, 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 tradition, follows the matter of Ephraim. That's what we, we, uh, we follow, written by Ephraim Zamun Malgolius. So, he says many things, and then at the bottom there is a commentary by the uh, Elef Hamogin, was somebody who, uh, who, who, who commentated on it, which I think was himself writing in, in, in more uh, extensiveness. Anyway, see, so he says like this, goes through, about fasting, not fasting, and then how tshuva works, and so on and so forth. It says like this, The cost of besvarim, Ki ha-tshuva be-emes o-chliyos mitoich simcha. A tshuva, repentance, has got to be done through simcha. Do you mind the thoughts? Tshuva is one of the only mitzvahs we shouldn't do with simcha. Right? We say in this week's parasha twice, we mentioned Simcha first. For some machta b'chol ha-toiv, Hashem nosan lecha Hashem lekecha. You've got to rejoice with all the good that Hashem has given you. That's how they say, that's what happiness is. Look at what you have, not what you don't have. Past tense. Think of all the good things Hashem has given you, not what you still are lacking. That's, that's the point of Simcha. And then in the Teichach, the rebuke, the admonition, it says, why are you getting all this stuff? Not just Simcha, but Tov Levav, with a great, satisfying heart. So we know we have to have Simcha when we do Torah Mitzvahs. You know, thought the one mitzvah that doesn't require simcha is tshuva. What are you going to do? Jungle? Ah, I've done such terrible things. I did X, Y. You don't think that's appropriate, right? You know, thought the one mitzvah that perhaps, you know, you have a little bit of uh, remorse you have to have and a little bit of charod and crying. You would have thought that that's something you shouldn't do with simcha. You know, if you came into shul, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and you saw me dancing away, screaming, you would have think I'm, I'm off his rocker here. You know, it's not appropriate. But yet, the mitzvah has to be done 
with simcha. And not through low self-esteem and sadness. But yes, you have to have a broken heart, that's true. And you have to have remorse, and you have to be upset with yourself, but still have simcha. So how do you know if you're doing tshuva out of joy or tshuva out of sadness? If you're doing tshuva out of sadness and out of, you know, you're forced to do it and you're horrible and you feel so terrible about it with yourself and everything, you're angry and aggressive with everybody. You know, you blame everybody, everything's everybody's fault, the world, it's uh, my, you know, it's his fault, this fault, the world uh, owes me everything, and it's his, it, you know, cosmos' his fault, you know, universe's fault. You're always angry and aggressive with everybody. And it suddenly comes to laugh at him. Oh, how dare you say that to me? How dare you laugh at me? You know, you get angry and aggressive. That's Shuva out of Atzvus. That's not real Shuva. You're doing it out of sadness. You're doing it out of spite. When you do real Shuva, you realize, ah, I'm not such a big shot, actually. I'm not such a, a big person. You know, actually, I'm... I'm quite pathetic, I'm quite low, I sh- way missed my goals for this year, you know, my, my targets that were set last year, I quite badly missed them, and uh, I'm not quite uh, as good as I thought it was. I feel you are not going to be particular about anything, you're not going to be in chaos, you're not going to be in anger, you're not going to be screaming and shouting at everybody, because you're right, I appreciate I'm grateful to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that he gave me the opportunity to do tshuva because really, tshuva is a great kindness from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Really, it should be one strike and you're out, you know, goodbye. You know, if you work on airplanes and you make a mistake and you're, or you work on cars and you make a mistake and all these people die and, there's, you know, you're out of your job, right? One strike and you're out. So here, you would have thought the same thing, you know, we're on earth, we've got HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Torah, you know. No, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided in his great kindness he's going to allow this concept of teshuva. To return. The stock is on, but I didn't stock it, right? And it goes on to talk about uh, uh, Sadaka. So we see here also that Tshuva has to be done with Simcha. It's not a matter of being depressed, not a matter of being sad, it's a matter of being happy. You must always be happy, always be with Simcha. Yes, you have to realize what you did wasn't right, and you have to accept and acknowledge. Not just lip service, you know, you have, to, you have to really think. You know what they say, people are so busy davening and saying shuvah, they don't have time to pray, I think is the expression, right? You're so busy saying the words, but you're not really thinking what's going on. Stop and think, what am I asking Hashem to forgive me for? What do I feel that I need to work on? Where do I feel I need to improve? That everybody has to go through, everybody has to sit down, and everybody has to think themselves. Because otherwise, you're going to come, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, you're saying, well, da, 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 you know, what are you actually, everyone got the list of what they're davening for, right? I'm davening for this, and I'm davening for that, and I'm davening for him, and I'm davening for her, and I'm davening, I got, it, I got it all, got my laundry list. But you don't actually think about yourself. You don't actually think, well, what am I going to say to our Kodesh Baruch when he says, hello, it's your turn now. What are you going to say for yourself, right? What is, you know, you can't take any lawyers in with you. You know, you can't take in anybody to help you. It's you your private audience with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And it goes on to say here, see if I can find it, how do you know when it's your time, when it's your audience? Where was it? Talks about when in the middle of davening, when you get, you feel the sense of emotion and, and crying and tremendous tears, that's when you know your time is up. That's when you know, ah, now my Neshama is in with the audience. Where is it? Somewhere here, it talks about that's where you know, you know, um... Talks about here that uh, yeah, right. So it goes here and it goes on to further say somewhere here. I can't see it exactly now, but it talks like that's when you know that uh, that's when you're up is when you get this feeling sometimes. Sometimes you're down for no reason, you know. You're daydreaming, you know, or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, you feel this sense of oh, this pachas. That's when you know it's 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 your time, and that's when you should think during that time. Ah, I'm up. This is my chance, you know. What am I going to say to HaKadosh Baruch What am I going to think about to HaKadosh Baruch What am I going to try and say to him I will do better, I'm apologizing for? And that's what you're going to have prepared because when the moment comes, 
you know, as we say, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. You know, you're standing in front of the Melech Ma'achem Lachim, and you say, whoops, so, you know, you all get tongue-tied, and you get uh, all famished, and you miss the moment, and tough. So you've got to prepare these things already ahead of time. So I wanted to uh, uh, talk about a little something else. Talk about the community. We daven in a shul, we daven in a community, we daven with the community. So how does that have an effect on things, right? What's the effect of, of the Kehillim? So the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says, and uh, this is quite scary for me uh, personally, whatever, it says, Melech v'tzibur, you have a king and a tzibur. Now don't forget, this is an interesting word, because a melech usually has a people, right? You don't usually have a tzibur, melech and a tzibur. A melech has an arm, right? You're a melech of an arm. We're not a melech and a tzibur. A tzibur is a strange word to use when you're talking about subjects, right? So, melech v'am, melech nichnos t'chil aladin. The king goes first. Shenem alasos mishpot avdoi. First you do the mishpot of the, his servant, the king. Um mishpat amo Yisrael. Again, the pasuk is using the word amo. And then afterwards, you first you do the avdoi, and then you use the people. So the king goes first. Says the Gemara, just by the way, my time, and what's the reason, which is strange. You just told me a puzzle, so why are you telling me a reason? But you're saying, why does the Kodesh Baruch Hu do it this way? It's not normal to keep the king waiting outside. The king goes in first, right? Don't keep the king waiting. Like you want to do the king first before God gets really angry with everybody else. And he's going to take it out on the king. Uh, so we want to get the king in when things are quiet. You know, still a hate, get him in, get him out. And then we bring in the rest of the communities. It says Mufashim like this. You, the Gemara says, Man Malke, who are the kings nowadays? Rabbonon, the rabbis. Right? I'm not going into now. I said it at my uh, inauguration speech, what uh, rabbis and kings and so on. Not that I was getting carried away with the uh, positions of grandeur, but it uh, has important meaning. So this is talking about king, uh, a rabbi. That's why it says, Lasush Mishpat Avdoi, Eved, Eved Hashem. Rabbi is hopefully supposed to be a, a, an Eved Hashem. Even though Moshe Rabbeinu was called Moshe Avdi, one of the only people called Moshe Avdi, so to be called an Eved is uh, a huge responsibility. But anyway, so this refers to rabbis and who is the tzibur? Who is the congregation? The shul. So the idea is that people are judged with their shul and that communities are taken together. So, the way I understand it is like this. Hashem says, right, now it's time for Delray Beach. So come, come to Delray Beach Shul. Now I'm going to come to Delray Beach Shul. We'll go here, we'll go there. Next we'll move on to who knows where. You get judged through your shul, through the tzibul. That's why the, uh, the person davening for the Amud, the uh, shleich tzibul, he is davening on our behalf, and each community is separate, Right? If I'm in a community where, I don't know, the person, as it goes on here, is not doing a good job, whatever that means, or the person is not right, or the person has issues that a college worker is like, what are you doing doubling for me? Right? What are you up here for? Who are you? You've got all these sins. Get lost. How enough, you know, that uh, talks about it here, that uh, people who damn for the Ahmad and do things have to have exit shuva because, if I can find it here, and this again is quite scary, it says everybody is only judged according to their audit and their review at the time now, like I mentioned, right? That's the thing. It said, except the people who daven for the Amud. The people who daven for the Amud are judged in their entirety. So it's actually quite scary. I have it here. The people who daven for the Amud shats, that they have to uh, do proper tshuva. They have to go further because HaKadosh Baruch is much more exacting with people who are davening for the home. Not that we're bringing Chas Rishad Din down on, on, on anything. We don't want to say. But it says here, everyone uh, that Adam Nadim Lefisha, a person is judged, as we said. It's only what you're doing now while he's there. But I suppose the manager, the leader, you know, if anything goes wrong, whose who's neck is on the line? The manager, the boss, you know, if anything comes around, they found out afterwards, the people involved are okay. But the manager or the person who's, who's in charge, the, the, the boss, he's the one who's going to have to pay the price, you know. So it's the same here with the people. So as long each sibo, each community is its own unit, its own entity. That's why it's so important to uh, get uh, uh, somebody who's role, somebody who's fitting to, to lead the davening and to, to so on. That's why a lot of shuls take the great effort and they have... Uh, anyway, so each congregation has its own unique ability to influence outcomes for everybody sitting there, right? 
So even if you were in your own, davening at home, Hashem was right, this would be what you were doing, this would be how you would be judged, this would be what your pekka will be for the coming year. But if you're in a shul, and the tzibur is worthy enough, and the rachamim is, is flowing, then you will be the beneficiary of that. Hashem said, well, if you were on your own, you'd be like this. But because you're in a shul, that they're doing really good for me, whatever it is, the shlich sibur, maybe we can think of him like the lawyer, right? He's, he's, he's the lawyer, the barrister, he's the one, oh, he's doing a good job, right? He's really trying to get you off, right? He's really uh, doing a good job of uh, turning the tides of the jury, you know, putting the wool over their face and arguing and putting doubt in your minds. And actually, you know what? You're not so bad, right? Oh, actually, I think you're quite good. So each shoe has its own unique opportunity. <laughs> That's why one rabbi said that he was used to go to shuls where people weren't expected much from them. You know, because in God's work, say, oh, come to this shul, whatever it is. And the people in the shul, I don't expect much from them. Ah, I expect a lot from you. You're a big rabbi over there. Ah, yeah, but because the tzibur itself is doing okay, we don't expect too much from them. I don't expect too much from you. But you go to a shul where everyone's expected a lot, and God's work expects a lot from the shul, then, ah, you're not doing so well. So there are some rabbis who like to go to, uh, I don't know how you would evaluate what is a shul that is uh, lower, uh, I don't know what that means and how it means, but there are some uh, Hasidic rabbis who used to go along these lines, right? And, you know, because you judge with the community, so the community are not so uh, holy and special that Akash Baruch didn't expect too much of them. Ah, okay, not too bad, and you get included with them. So what does that mean? That means that we have to remember when we're standing Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur with Meshavzimei Tshuva, we are one unit. Maybe the rest of the year we don't think of it that way. Maybe the rest of the year we think with the sum of our own individual parts. But Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, we are very, very much one unit, one community. And as you see from the Gemara, Melech with Tzibur, the Tzibur are judged together. The community are judged as a whole. So, of course, we need to take that to heart to remember that we need to have shalom. We need to have peace between one another. We need to be getting on well with one another. Now is not the time for fighting, for discourse, for screaming, shouting, any of these things, because now we are all in it together. We are all, you know, like an example, a marshal they give that the Titanic was sinking. So everybody, you know, they, they said the Titanic had all these different levels, right? They had the really, really rich, expensive uh, uh, seats or whatever you called it, the cabins, right? Or the people who were like, you know, the top of society. And then they had the bottom of the bottom, right? Who were in, I don't know, the very bottom, whatever they were. Steerage. What do you call it? Steerage. Steerage, right. Okay, so you had in the Titanic was this huge, you know, disparity of, of, of people, right? People with butlers, people with servants. But once the Titanic started to go down, once, whoops, the water was on board, ah, then, okay, it didn't work for a lot of people, of course, everyone starts pulling together. Doesn't matter who you are, what you are, you know, you either quite literally sink or swim, or whatever the expression is, swim or, uh, sink or swim, right? Because... When times of great tragedy, time of great need, time of great sorrow, or whatever you want to call this, time of great fear, everybody pulls together. So that's the example they give of the Titanic, where there was this great disparity, but when it came to, to, to tragedy, came to this great fear, this impending doom, everyone was together. We had this with the hurricane last week, that all of a sudden, everyone was coming together. It was a time where we had great actors, I've said this for my sermons before, that it shouldn't take tragedies like some of these anti-Semitic attacks. All of a sudden, we have this anti-Semitic attack, a shooting, chas v'shalom, whatever it is, everyone's all joining together. Oh, we've got to come to shul. Oh, we're hidden with it. Shouldn't take that. That's how we should be all the rest of the year, of course. But especially Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, no matter what's gone on the rest of the year, no matter what we're going to do after Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we're going to go back to whatever we're going to go back to. But during the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur time, and we'll add sukkahs in for good measure, because sukkahs is like the posting of everything, right? Or I call it sale or return, right? It's sealed on Yom Kippur, 
But, you know, Amazon Prime, you, you can uh, send it back, you know. Or HaKadosh Baruch Hu can recall it. Ah, wait, no, 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 I made a mistake. You know, like, uh, whatever. So that's how I uh, think of that one until Oshana Rabba when it's mailed out, you know. Uh, and then if it's good, great. We hope it comes Amazon Prime two-day shipping. And if it's bad, let's hope it gets lost in the mail somewhere, you know, or one of these, uh, whatever. <laughs> but the idea is that we have to be together more than ever during this period, during this time. I don't know how it works for people who go to different shuls. I must admit, I've always uh, found that interesting. Shouldn't really go to the same shul because it's a, it's a process, right? You, you go, but anyway, I always find it interesting how it works conceptually for people who are in different shuls, right? Not saying it's wrong, Chas Shalom, you're looking at me because I know you're going to Etch Yisrael. I'm all worried. But I'm not saying Chas Shalom, it's us. I didn't mean it that way at all. But, uh, you know, the idea is you're with your tzibur, you start with the tzibur, you finish with the tzibur. So, so uh, ideally, you're supposed to have, I suppose, the same shul, the same, uh, uh, the same chazonim and the same everything. But uh, that's just... Uh, that's another story. But uh, it's all one unit. You know, I like to say, I think, Elul, if you like, and uh, Slichas is the, pre- uh, the pre-season, right? We've just started football season, right? Miami not doing very well. So, uh, Patriots doing great. Patriots doing great, right. Okay. We should all be Patriots of HaKadosh Baruch Hu at this time of the year. So, you know, like, now is the pre-game. The pre-season, rather. And then Rosh Hashanah says, Meit Shuvah, if you like, is the... Uh, is the uh, is the regular season Yom Kippur, if you like, is the postseason, and when it comes to the Ida, then you're at the championship game. What's it called? The Super Bowl. That's the Super Bowl where the medals are handed out. And as I said last year in my sermon, if you remember on uh, on, on the Ila time, we know the verse and I gave many examples. I can't remember them. This guy who scored all these home runs in the last innings and came back. And I remember a few years ago, there was the biggest ever comeback from half time in, in the Super Bowl. Was it the Atlanta Falcons were 52 something ahead and uh, some other team won? Who was it? Uh, anyway, so they came back and, 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 and there was, uh, you know, and a few years ago, uh, 19. And somebody said, Solomon, that's right. Someone came up and said, I was there at that game. Some famous game. I got my notes in my map, so I wrote it down. Uh, about somebody walked off a walk off uh, no that was in baseball yes. there was some walk uh, some uh, and Solomon said I was at that game um, but anyway I think it was actually the day after Yom Kippur as well which was what made it even special so you've always got time no matter how great you come out of the blocks no matter how fantastic you start how far ahead of the game you are how many points ahead you know it's all about how you finish it's all about the end you can always be usurped right at the end. You think you're doing so great, and then you relax. You, you know, I'll take it easy now. You know, like I always used to think when I was a kid, I could never understand. I used to watch athletic and you know, pace setters. You know what pace setter is, right? They go out. They put, and like, how come pace setters never ever win the race? They never win the race. They go out. They're miles ahead of everyone. They're trying to set the pace for all the people to go faster, and the pace setters never win. I could never understand it. Why? I was little kissing. They're miles ahead. How come these pace setters are not winning? Because they get tired, they get exhausted, and they finish. Okay. Right? Well, the people, they uh, got to pace themselves. So the same as Rosh Hashanah and Kippur Sukkot. It's all about the end game. It's all about Ne'ilah. We're building up. We're getting all the energy. We're getting our fitness levels, if you like, our religious fitness levels. We're working on doing Yemei Slichos. We're going through our religious exercises to play the game. We're going through everything till it comes to Yom Kippur, till it comes to the Super Bowl game. Our tactics have been honed. All the plans have all been written out in our minds. We know exactly what we're doing. So when the pressure and the stress time of Ne'ilah comes, we know exactly what to say. We know exactly what to think. And in that, of course, in that marriage, as we're about to start the uh, preseason, we're getting our dusting off our boots and dusting off our jerseys or our gloves or whatever it is or our helmets as we're about to get ready. May I give you a bracha? This week's schedule, we give a, we ask Hakadosh Baruch Hu to give a bracha. It's very strange. Of course, there's many brachas that Hakadosh Baruch Hu gives, but this week we actually ask Hakadosh Baruch Hu for a bracha. When you gave the vidui ma'aseh, you did all your giving of tzedakah, you say to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashkifa mimayin kajcha, look down from your holy abode, uvarech es amcha Yisrael. Very strange. We say to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, now it's your turn. We've done our bit, okay? Now you look down, and uh, a lot of people have the minute to, to say that puzzle very, very loud. 
Um, but uh, anyway, so that's where you raise Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Look, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Shkifa v'Mayin Kachcha, come, Uvarech es Amcha Yisrael. So that's why I say to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, person, Shkifa v'Mayin Kachcha, Meshumayim, look down from your holy abode, Uvarech es Amcha, your people here in Dos, in Delray Beach, that we should all be written and inscribed in the non-existent book of life, as we found out now, and we should be inscribed in the non-existent book of good health and in the non-existent book of Panos Tova, and all be inscribed in the non-existent book of those who will be present and have front row seats at the coming and the celebration of the coming of Mashiach by the Kaisel you, in, in, in the base Amigdash we built. Bimheira v'yameinu v'demar. Amen. Thank you.